So this is what Bay Area Maker Fair starts out like. We're all waiting here in this big group and there's a big fire thing happening in the back. See it? I would call this Burning Man light. Clearly these are uh, vehicles that are destined for the playa or maybe they were on the playa last year. And there is the giant bug fire sculpture that we saw a minute ago. Well, it's no Tesla, but here it is, an electric Porsche race car, pretty cool. That is a lot of wiring to have to do by hand. And I think these are pretty famous, these little cupcake carts. It's like one of those Make Magazine things that were really popular. Still pretty cool, lots of years after they first came out. All right, so I'm in some tent here and there's these crazy light boxes, these big head light boxes. <laughs> it's pretty fun. This is pretty interesting. We've got this, uh, they're calling it a Maker Muscle. And it's just a NEMA 17 motor. It looks like it's running a uh, lead screw. And that is activating sort of a linear motion. That could be pretty useful. Here we are in Kinetic Sculpture Alley. Look at all these uh, humanoid looking movable things. So, this is the button. And when I press it, Mr. Robot there on the trampoline will jump. Pretty fun. Okay, I'm here at the DigiKey booth. You can see they've got their uh, fancy bicycle spoke thing going on. And right over here behind me here, you can see this leaderboard. And that has everything to do with the device that I'm holding in my hand. So this is a fancy game of rock, paper, scissors. So what you do is anybody, you get one of these, and you walk around the fair, and anybody that you see wearing one of these, you play rock, paper, scissors with them. You, uh, you choose your rock, your paper, or scissor based on this little joystick. So I'm going to choose paper right here. I would hold that forward, I would hold it up, and when I point it at the person, whatever they're holding up is their, uh, is their choice. And it keeps a score, it keeps a record of who's been winning. And at the end of the day, uh, they've got a leaderboard there, and I guess there's a prize for the, uh, the rock, paper, scissor champion of Maker Faire 2017, day by day. How cool is that? Story time. My sister is in the medical profession and she needs orthotics for her feet. And I was always thinking that's got to be the easiest thing to 3D print. Scan your feet, 3D print them. Well, that's exactly what these guys are doing. It's really cool. It's a good innovation. Let's look at it. So it looks like we've got a TPU style uh, rubber that they printed the whole sole with. And inside of these, there's like an orthotic, like a custom, a custom made arch support for your feet based on a scan that they do of your foot. Really great idea. So here is an extra large X, Y, and Z style 3D printer. So here's the BL Touch Booth. It's a great sensor for your 3D printer. Uh, it works on based on touching instead of your inductive sensors, hi, or your uh, any other way of doing proximity. It's actually got a little probe and when that touches the bed it uh, retracts and it knows that it's reached the uh, the print height. So a great technology and they're representing here at Maker Faire. So this is a desktop based uh, clay 3D printer. It's an FDM printer and they're just using a stepper motor like a really big NEMA 17 uh, with a lead screw to act as the pump to push the clay through that tube right there and then that goes up the clear acrylic tube and out the uh, the print head. So it's just your, your regular old FDM 3D printer but you end up with objects like this and you can see they've glazed it or used different colors of clay as they were printing and yeah this is a, this is a really successful little unit here. Uh, I wonder how technically challenging it is and, and uh, how often you get failed prints because uh, I can see this being really useful for clay artists. Uh, yeah, neat stuff. 
So there you can see the uh, Clay XYZ uh, banner in the background. They're live on Kickstarter right now, so if you're interested in that sort of a thing, I haven't tested it, I can't tell you anything about how it works, but it looks pretty cool uh, holding those objects in my hand. I was pretty impressed. Hey, so I wanted to take a quick moment uh, out of show and tell here to apologize for the camera work. Uh, I'm just sort of running and gunning uh, here at the Maker Fair. This wasn't anything that I planned, and uh, I don't know how good my camera work or even the audio quality is going to be. So bear with me. I uh, hope I'm showing you some things that you haven't seen before. And uh, if you weren't able to attend, uh, maybe you'll get to see the things that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to see at all. So uh, yeah, well, we'll get right back to it now. Okay, I gotta use my phone to illuminate myself because my camera won't work on the low light here. This is the LED room. This is a giant pavilion. And you can see the lights in the background from all the different booths, uh, all the different things that are being shown off. Uh, I wish I could really show them and do them justice, but let's just say that this is a really cool room with lots of LED-based projects. There's another view of the uh, inflatable glowing forest. Uh, I don't think it's going to come through on camera because it's just really cool being surrounded by those things. Uh, even as an adult, it was pretty neat walking in there. And then there's these guys making a killing with fidget spinners. Perfect timing to hit this fad with Maker Fair. I'll bet they're making a nice fortune today. So I'm here at the Mimaki booth and we have a rotary wheel cutter cutting some cardboard. And This is similar to a uh, Cartesian 3D printer but they have a rotary wheel that has to know which direction the line is, so it's, it gets pretty fancy in there. Pretty neat stuff, really critical if you want to cut fabric out, like for your, uh, your pre-cut fabric forms for sewing. Good stuff. Expensive machine though, this machine right here, you can see it's pretty small, and it goes for about $16,000. So hopefully somebody comes up with a nice DIY version here in the near future. And here of course is the Prusa Research uh, table. This is amazing stuff. Four color printing. It's got a uh, changeable head there. You can see all four colors coming in with the, uh, the Bowden tube set up. And they're using an E3D hot end. And they're getting a nice, uh, a nice print. Let's look at one of these up close. Look at that detail. Just phenomenal stuff. Really smooth print. And all three colors just flawlessly printed. So apparently they have their own uh, slicer available on their website. I'm gonna have to check that out. So I'm here at the uh, Prusa booth with Andy. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. And this table has their, uh, let me stand over here. This table has their multi-material prints going on. And this is just fantastic. These guys are again, redefining what you can do with a home-based 3D printer uh, by achieving pretty much seamless four color 3D printing. And I want to talk to Andy about how he's making that happen. So first of all, you guys have a sort of custom heat break in your E3D hot end, is that right? Right, so one of the recent reasons that we were holding up on our shipment was to optimize the heat break. We're still using E3D components, but we've kind of optimized the internal geometry for all the things that are happening in the multi-material process, all the retractions and loading right. and unloading. Right, so I, I have a little experience, as people on my YouTube channel know, with trying to print with three colors, not even four, and I get those strings that sort of jam everything up. And with that custom heat rake, you guys are kind of able to address that problem, right? Well, it's more about, like, there's, there's it's a more optimized internal geometry to prevent plugging. Because as you're exchanging different uh, filaments, yeah. the, you know, once the end comes into the barrel, it kind of deforms a little bit. Right. So you need to make sure that the inside is perfect so that you can pull it out every single time without uh, any jams. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so uh, beyond that, I hear you guys have your own slicing software as well. We do. We're, we're just building on top of Prusa edition of Slicer. Okay. So technically today, you can go on GitHub, and under Slicer settings, there's a whole profile there for uh, multi-material settings. Right. But what's missing is you know the little wipe tower feature. Oh, these little, yeah. These little swatches that make sure that you get clean transitions between colors. Right. This is so key, because I've been using, um, what is it, Repetier Host with the Cura engine, and it only works with two colors. Right. So we have a big problem when it jams up when you try to do three or four colors. Right. Yeah, so what we're, we're doing is uh, you can specify the spacing you need to make sure that when you're changing colors, it extrudes enough material to transition from one color to the next and be completely clean and clear. That's why when you look at some of our prints, 
difference. You don't see any bleeding or crossover of previous colors. Can you tell me how, because with the with the two, it basically prints them in a way that you can only really do it with two colors. Yeah. Whereas when you try to do three, you're now basically printing over the exact same space twice. How do you achieve four in a single tower? So remember, for four materials, you only need essentially three areas of wiping, because when right. you exchange, it's just right. overdoing yep, yep. Uh, the previous layer. So essentially, it knows how many extruders you have, and essentially you can specify the length and depth for each area. That's as, fantastic. As you, so as it wipes. when are you going to release this for everyone then? I think well, we, the plan is it should have been done yesterday, yeah. <laughs> but you know uh, we started shipping just yesterday as we, well. We can't complain. Without you guys, the industry would not be advancing as much as it is. So we thank right. you a whole bunch, and we just we're chomping at the at the bit, and we want that sooner than later. Um, but yeah, so we can download that slicer, and, and maybe sooner than later you'll be able to have just the slicer profiles. Remember, it's still Prusa edition of slicer. Our slicer. And then the only thing that isn't publicly available at this moment is the post processor to make those little swatches for white towers. So that's not even available. So if you buy this machine, though, you get access to that. Yeah. Okay. And it'll I'm, be publicly available probably within the coming weeks. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, open source for the win. Absolutely. You guys are just giving the farm away. I can't believe it. Thank you so much for innovating and like bringing the industry along. Yeah, I mean, it's the core of what we do. And, yeah. you know, the community helps us along the way. It's always good to get feedback early on. Yeah, yeah. As we develop new things. Okay. So, hey guys, uh, Prusa Research, making it happen. And thanks again. Yeah, not a problem. So here we are at the Form Labs booth. And you can see their beautiful printer working. Now this is a little different than our usual FDM printer. This is used as a resin. And it's, is this, hey guys, is this a based on a, uh, the projector, the DLP, or is this the laser one? This is S SLA, okay, fantastic. But you can just see it just grows right out of the bed, and look at how fast that laser moves. So what's your like rate of growth for a material like this, or a, a print like this? So this model is gonna take about 14 hours. 14 hours total, and it's gonna print how tall? Oh wow, okay, so that, that's all from 14 hours. And you guys should just, I wish you were here in person to just see the resolution on this. It's just out of this world. Now, how much uh, sort of washing of the material do you have to do? Yes. Um, about 20 minutes in isopropyl alcohol to wash off any liquid resin. Oh, just general isopropyl. You don't even have to use any, like, crazy chemicals. Nope. nope. Stuff you could buy at CVS or any okay. drugstore. Okay. And what does a machine like this cost? Uh, that guy's 3500 for 3, the whole package. That's not bad, you guys. We're getting, we're getting in, like prosumer price range, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah. We're looking at the craziest CMC machine I've seen yet. And this is uh, based on these two points up there, and it's just gravity holding it down with the brick. I imagine the uh, the biggest challenge here is holding the router to the material itself, which is sort of canted on, a, on, a, on an angle. But this is a great and very inexpensive way to do some, some very large CNC cuts. And kudos to these guys for bringing it to market. By the way, this is Maslow. For only $350, you can CNC cut. So we've kind of wandered into the uh, CNC corner over here of the whole, the whole Maker Fair. We've got a CMC machine here, the ShopBot. And we got the HandyBot here. This would be the Shaper Origins competition. And then over here, we've got the Tormach machines. So I'm here at the, uh, this would be the HandyBot booth. Who am I talking to? My name's Brian. Hi, Brian. So, what do we have here? This looks like a home-based, handheld CNC machine. So the HandyBot is a portable, small-scale CNC machine. It's only about 40 pounds. You can lift it up and carry it around anywhere you want to do your work. And you load your jobs into it over Wi-Fi, meaning you can use your telephone, your tablet, your laptop, anything you want to to load your work into the tool. And you put the tool on top of the material that you want to cut into. So. In this case, we're cutting into these uh, wooden badges right here. We've built a little jig, we pop the badge in there, and then we have someone draw out a uh, design on a tablet. And that design is translated into G-code, which is what CNC tools understand. And then that's used to cut out the design in the badge. Very cool, and because it's got these handles on it, I could effectively be cutting on a four by eight sheet of plywood, right? Exactly, so the cut area of the handy bot is six inches by eight inches, but you can move it along a larger piece of wood and cut out larger designs. And how do you locate between cuts? So the tool has a number of locating features. The most popular one is up in the front, you insert a key into the front of the tool, and you insert that key into a, a rail that has V grooves in it. So you move it along the rail, uh, at six inch increments. And that rail is something we also provide uh, to people that buy the tool. Oh, okay. Can you, 
can you dynamically move it or do you have to locate it with each, with each cut? You want to locate it and clamp it down between each cut. Oh, I gotcha. So here, um, what I'm showing here is some making some trail signs for a local trail system near my house. Oh, nice. So I slide the boards through the HandyBot and I cut out the letters for the trail sign in increments. So I am able to do, you know, 20 or 30 trail signs in an afternoon just by sliding our, my two by sixes through the handy bot. Okay, so unfortunately that's all I have the time to show you guys of Maker Faire 2017. It's still going on uh, right down over there, but I have other work that I need to get done. So that's it for me and that's it for this video. Uh, you know the drill, hit that subscribe button and hit the little bell icon so that you're notified when I release new videos. I know I don't put them out often enough. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching. See you next time.